vehicle introduction is competitive on a global basis. Uh, the reason for that is that there are original equipment manufacturers, so for example that's a BMW or a Mercedes-Benz or Hyundai, um, and the manufacturers are in a situation where they're competing for future car sales. So their issues are, one, they would like people to continue to buy their current product and, a, and an automated version of it, but also they're concerned about uh, rideshare and they're very concerned about Uber and Lyft and these types of companies, which could, for example, buy very large fleets of motor vehicles and then deploy the vehicles uh, on a no-name basis. In other words, does it really matter what the brand of the vehicle is? And I'd suggest to you it probably doesn't matter. So the countries that are involved have got different sets of uh, drivers. So for example, Germany has just uh, brought forward the first sets of legislation on, on a national basis which allow, the, allow driverless vehicles to be driven on road. So that's actually in place. Now, why would that happen? Well, you've got BMW, Mercedes-Benz. There's an interest in that, uh, in that country in doing that. Then we have countries like the UK, where the UK really sees the mobility as a service platforms as, as a route to take. And of course, when you think about the UK, what are they specialised in? Well, their, their underground rail systems are fantastic. Um, they understand the benefits of connectivity with, with Europe. They understand that uh, the future of the digital technologies are important to them. And so London itself has digital strategies. So their idea is actually to become world leaders in the introduction of automated vehicles so they can actually have major input into the digital technologies and mobility as a service platforms. Then we have the US has a very different set of interests in this, which, is, which, is, which has got to do with smart cities and smart infrastructure. And it's not just smart vehicles, because vehicles need to talk to infrastructure, but, but from an, a US perspective, they want the motor vehicles essentially to take over from public transport if they can, and they also want to be able to sell smart technologies. And then if we sort of jump to some of the outliers, like a good example of that would be Finland, which, leading, which is leading the world in relation to mobility as a service platforms. Um, they've just done a major restructure of their transport networks. And instead of um, uh, really splitting between trains and trams and vehicles and buses, what they start with is data. And because their idea is that we will, we will develop an open data system that allows any provider, and they're deregulating the providers, it doesn't matter whether you're a tram, a bus, a motor vehicle, a private motor vehicle, you can tap into the data system and you can, de you can decide either which route you'd like to take or how you can find passengers. And so their idea is actually an open data system driven outcome. So what we have on a country by country base is very different sets of drivers and very different sets of, of outcomes. And, and a primary rationale for this book is to establish what roles Australia should take here because we have historically been an, a good exporter of motor vehicles and as we'd all be aware today, we don't currently manufacture vehicles anymore. That doesn't mean we can't do it in the future and it doesn't mean that we haven't got opportunity. But our big opportunity really is our, our spatial dispersion and our opportunity for, mo for as I call it, diverse mo mobility outcomes. We could be very good at that because it's something that we need to do. Thank you.